What's going on, guys? Welcome back to a great conversation. Today, we are talking to Chloe Dykstra. This conversation was awesome. Talk about somebody who I really just didn't know and walked into this having a great rapport with. She was so cool. I'm so honest, and, and you know, there was there was all this controversy that happened a couple years ago when she wrote this Medium article, and I didn't know if we were going to talk about it, if I brought it up, if she would want to. She was so cool about the whole thing, really answered every question, and then I learned so much about her that I didn't know. Um, you know, Chloe's dad won an Oscar for Star Wars. She, she seemed to think that I knew that, because, like, everybody knows that about her. I had no idea. It's a real thing. I found that out on the show. It's so cool. Um, and yeah, she just, she had great stories. She was so, so positive about pretty much everything I asked her about and so humble, crazy humble, insane humble for somebody as famous as she is. So, um, enjoy the show guys. She was a treat to talk to, and I, I really hope you enjoy this. Leave your comments below with your thoughts about the interview. Um, you know, comments and the notification bell and the likes, all those things people always ask for on these YouTube channels. They really do mean everything to these things. Um, when you're a brand new channel, all those interactive little elements are what YouTube is basing stuff off of. So if you haven't hit the notification bell, please do. If you haven't hit subscribe, please do that. We're trying to hit this goal. We're trying to get to 2,000 subscribers by my birthday on June 6th. I don't know if we're going to get there, but we're trying. We're trying to get over the hump. So uh, you know, help me out if, you, if you're interested in doing that. Hit the thumbs up button and check back every single week for brand new content. Big thanks to Chloe, and, uh, and I can't wait to see you guys back for the next one of these. Salute and enjoy the show. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Nerds in Suits, a great conversation. Today, we're talking to Chloe Dykstra. You guys probably know Chloe from being like the coolest person on the internet, cosplay extraordinaire, professional gamer, does all kinds of cool stuff. Um, I have so many questions. I've always wanted to meet her. I always wanted to talk to her, and we're going to bring her on the show right now. Chloe, how you doing? Hey, Ben. What a great intro. <laughs> I feel like I kind of wore a suit, but not really. It kind of looks like a suit if there's a mic in front of, of it, but... You're like you're like internet nerd formal. It's good. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm wearing black, so there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I didn't. I, the invitation didn't say a black tie affair, but you you read the room, so <laughs> thank you. I appreciate I tried. That. I tried. We're in quarantine. I tried. Yeah, totally. Now I would have I would have tacked on actress to your to your introduction because I know that that is obviously a major passion for you and something you do a lot of. But as right now we're all stuck in our homes, it's like the toughest one to do. It feels like there's not a lot of a lot of acting going on unless it's just you know straight to camera like this. Um, but I know you had a movie come out fairly recently, and there was like a Twitch stream of it recently. Oh that, yeah, you right? you really did your homework. Yeah, I did. Uh, I did a movie called Diminuendo, uh, and that came out. I don't even know officially when it came out, but we filmed it back in like 2016, I believe, 17. Yeah. Um, and it's a really cool, weird little indie film. Um, I was really fortunate to be a part of. Um, it's funny because I. I do call, I guess I would say I'm an actress. It's tough to say because I feel like I've done, I grew up in LA, so I feel like I've done every single role that yeah. there is to do on a set at some point. Um, but I just really ultimately like to work on on cool things. And Diminuendo, when I read the script, I was just like completely blown away by how unique and interesting it was. And uh, yeah, it was. it's a very weird movie. I, it's hard for me to even pitch it. it it's basically like a drama, sci-fi um almost like a dystopian future that's near future where um, a company starts building dolls, like very lifelike dolls to represent uh, human beings, right? So essentially I play like a Marilyn Monroe type of character who dies, unfortunately, um, very tragically. And they want to bring her back to life to star in a movie about herself. So they have to go back to her old boyfriend to have him direct it. And it's this really dark twisted uh film and there's so many um, brilliant people who worked on it so it was cool it was a cool project it's yes yeah, so you're and you so you get to play both the actress who dies and then the double so you're playing like a robot sort of side like that type like an ex machina type of situation yeah like, yeah yeah okay. i got to be a robot it was it was cool because there's also no ai in the character uh which is also very unique because whenever you see androids and stuff they're all is she real? Is she not? But she doesn't even have whatever conversation that comes out of her mouth is essentially imagined either by it's either imagined by the person talking to her or uh, or you, she has an acting coach that feeds her lines and performances and she has to recreate it. It's really cool. Yeah, it sounds awesome. So I mean, yeah. it sounds really complicated. <laughs> I'm making it sound way more complicated than it is. Just watch it. It's on. I think it's on Amazon. I love sci-fi stories. I mean, that sounds like a very, very cool story. And given the opportunity to continue doing stuff like that, I mean, is that 
would that be the ultimate passion for you is continuing on as an actress? That's the the goal more than the other stuff? It's tough. I I just I just really like making things. I like contributing where I can and, you know, um, working with really creative, talented people, um, whether I'm coming onto their projects or they're coming on my projects or, you know, I, I just I feel like I've been in I, I it's really tough to say. I would love to be an actor. Yes, yeah. I would. I would very much enjoy <laughs> continuing that line of work as well. But I also really would. I don't know if I would be happy if I wasn't also writing or trying to right. do something or trying to direct something. So I've always been kind of the same way. I jump around between a lot of things. Like I moved to L.A. when I was 21 to do uh, music, to be a musician and, and like acting and modeling and all that, that stuff. You kind of do it all when you come here. Right. And, and yeah. You jump you around see what from, works. And you jump around from like whatever's working, I guess, is the other thing, too. As long as you have a certain amount of passion for each one. Yeah, um, exactly. But I know a lot of the people probably watching this got to know you from your work doing cosplay stuff as a host. Uh, and that was in, in the video game world, right? The cosplay video game world is kind of where you made your name. Cosplay, like when when is that a thing that got into your life? When did you start doing that for fun before it was even professional? I don't even know if it was. I guess it technically was professional because I did guest as a cosplayer a few times. I, I don't know. Show, I, I, right? Called just I did have a show, but that <laughs> wouldn't. I they It was a show, but it wasn't. I was a newbie. I was the newbie on the show anyway. I uh, I got into it when I was like 19. I think around the first time I started going to Comic-Con, I had a group of friends that I really loved um, that would dress up um, and make one of the first web series that I ever worked on was this thing called There Will Be Brawl. And it's really old. It was, I think, old, old machinima, old machinima. I was 19. I dressed like, um, a, a, I was a prostitute Malin from, <laughs> from Zelda. Okay. And, uh, you know, we all just love to dress up and we went to one Halloween party and we, uh, my boyfriend at the time and I dressed up as Left 4 Dead characters and <laughs> we went to the party thinking we were going to be the only ones. And there were like 20 damn people in Left 4 Dead costumes <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I found my people. And so then, uh, yeah, I just started going to conventions and I realized people could dress up and they would invite me to be part of their cosplay groups. And I'm like, oh, this is so great. And then I got this offer to be on the show for sci-fi. And I was like, no, I don't wanna do that. No, I'm not, I'm not, I just do it for fun. And they kept pushing and pushing. I was like, okay, fine. And uh, it was a really weird experience being on a reality show, especially one about cosplay. But uh, it was like a weird summer camp, I would say. Do you uh do you still like spend like a, lots of time at home making costumes? And oh like hell that? no, no! no. I love costumes. I I think that cosplay is such a cool art form, but I I just don't have the money to just. I don't want to. I think there was a certain level of I needed a place to belong when I first started cosplaying. I felt like I didn't have my nerds or whatever. Yeah. Um. I grew like again. I grew up in L.A. I I started. This is going to sound really douchey. I did start modeling when I was like 13. So I was surrounded by people who were just like in this industry and I never felt like I fit in. And so when I found people who cosplay, I was like, I like this. And then I think that at some point when I sort of stopped feeling that need to have my people, I kind of went, I don't, I don't feel like this is a thing that I need to express myself anymore. Plus I have like 30 damn costumes in my garage. There's no space for anymore. <laughs> so you kept a lot of them. That's cool. I did. I did. I I shouldn't because it's definitely a lot of space. I mean, that was the other problem with cosplay is I was in a one bedroom apartment and like we hoard cosplayers yeah. hoard. Uh, and I just did not have the space to keep doing that. I was destroying my floors, which was like, good. <laughs> I just needed to chill out a little bit. So um, the, those days you, you mentioned when you started modeling that that world, what was the hardest part about trying to fit into that world? What, what about <sighs> that was such a challenge? Oh man, I don't know. It's 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 tough to say. I thought that that was sort of a normal kind of life. Um, I I didn't fit in at school at all. I got bullied real real. Can I can, can I curse? Yeah yeah yeah. Go ahead. Okay, I got bullied really fucking bad <laughs> in high school. <laughs> um, and you know we had a very small school, so there wasn't really an opportunity to make friends once you were already the school weirdo. Um, and then I got sort of thrown into modeling and you know, after having been turned down for, you know, dates 50 times at school, like I finally was like, oh, I can be, this is an attractive thing to males. Like, this is cool. <laughs> um, but at the same time, I just sort of, 
I think there was probably an air of pretension on my part too. Cause I'm like, nobody plays video games. I don't, I don't have, but also at the same time, you know, they would sort of like look down at me and they go, Oh, you play D and D. Oh, that's really, that's really cute. How cute. What a cute little nerd. Um, and so I just sort of felt like, I also felt like I wasn't really part of the cool kids. And I think that that weird sort of pretentiousness that I had was absolutely a defense mechanism because I felt so insecure around all of these very attractive individuals, you know? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the modeling world's a strange one. And I think it's one that, um, I think it's definitely a world that if you see in magazines and you imagine what it's like based on movies, it seems like just like cool and you go do it and you shoot things, you get lots of money, you fly around and like- I mean, it's not that far off, but there's a lot of not great aspects to it too. Um, it's 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 very strange to be sexualized so young and sort of be thrown into um, a set where there's no real requirements for safety. Yeah. Um, and I also think like going back to the nerd thing for the record, I do think that the nerd thing is a double edged sword. Right. Yeah. Because I also do feel, uh, you know, when you're a nerd, it's either like you're being gatekeeped. So then you start sort of gatekeeping yourself. And I definitely remember yeah. feeling a little yeah. gatekeeping and and and. Um, sort of separated from from the cool kids. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was it was uh, it was modeling was probably everything that you would imagine. Um, I didn't get hardcore into it. I didn't want to be a model. I was like, yeah. this is what I do. I don't it's not like this is my passion. Uh, so I didn't, you know, fly to Milan and stuff. I didn't go do the fashion fashion shows. They pay yeah. nothing. They're terrible. Like, and then you have to be super skinny. Nah, that sucks. No, thanks. I never even like, I never liked that stuff either. It's modeling. Yeah, I know. I know. It's, it's well, it's, we're, we're in a different age now that with like Instagram has kind of changed everything, but you mentioned getting, yeah, it's weird. You mentioned getting turned down like 50 times. You're saying you asked out guys and, and, and they turned you down 50 times. Oh my That's God. I was boy crazy. I couldn't get a date for a long time. I had an internet boyfriend for a minute. Um, who's actually really talented and you should check him out. His name is Neil Ciceriga. He's lovely. We're still buddies, but yeah, I was with him on and off for a couple of years, but he was my internet boyfriend. I tried dating a guy in high school. I asked the guy out twice. I invited him to the Spider-Man premiere and he was like, no, I was like, oh, okay. Wow. I can't, that's, that's astounding. I feel like the people watching this would be, would be blown away. Oh, um, come on. No. What's your I, I, that's what's really your sweet. I was also very, I just want to clarify also, significantly more awkward. I'm awkward now. If you think I'm awkward now, you should have seen me in high school. What's the, what's your favorite? What's your best story of getting turned down? Is it the Spider-Man from here? Is that the best one? Oh, God. I don't know. One. I yeah. feel like that was, that was the hardest one. I think because I was obsessed with this guy. I was so yeah. in love with him. And he was, I asked him out once. He said, no, I asked him a Spider-Man from here. He said, no. And then uh, I'm trying to think if there's another one. Oh, I mean, there, there's definitely ones. I'm just trying to think of a good story. Uh, most of them are just no. And then that was the end of the story. But yeah, it was it was very tough. My also one of my friends would always get boys over me. And I was always kind of like, all right. Uh, yeah. Okay, that situation. Yeah, <laughs> classic. Yeah. Uh, your first screen credit is Spider Man Two. Is that the is that the premiere we're talking about? Is the actually Yeah, that was the yeah. first one. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I didn't, I was in Spider-Man one, but you can barely see me and I'm fairly certain I don't have a credit for it. So. Okay. Wow. So you're in both Spider-Man movies. It's entirely nepotism. Yeah. My father, my dad did all the effects on it. So I got lucky uh, and then I got to be an extra on them. So. Very cool. It's so weird how those movies, like when they were coming out, I remember it was the biggest deal in the world. Cause I was, I was like a little chubby kid when I was a kid. I love comic books. I have 6,000 comics in my mom's basement. I mean, that was my whole, that's life. rad. That's so cool. Yeah. I worked in comic book stores. And so when the first Spider-Man came out, I remember, uh, there was like a preview screening in Seattle where I'm from and I got to skip school and go with the owner of the comic book store. He like brought me in. So I saw it before all my friends. That's so, thing. that's so cool. That's such an <laughs> exciting thing. Yeah, it was it was blew my mind, but it's weird how when you look back at those movies and then the Amazing Spider-Man movies, it really does show you the impermanence of media that we have now. This new generation of Spider-Man movies, I feel the worst for Andrew Garfield to be honest. Those that he he, I feel like he's the one that gets screwed when you remember like the Spider-Man movies. It's like I feel like some people don't even realize he played Spider-Man anymore. Yeah, I, mean, I forgot. So exciting. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I know the impermanence of media, especially with all the superhero films. I feel like it's just unfortunately been, I have a very controversial opinion about this. Oh, please. I feel like all the superhero movies have just completely diluted the entire genre and the standouts are so few and far in between now because there's so many and it's so hard to do something different and interesting. 
um, that you're kind of like, you're kind of screwed either way going into it. I think Taika is kind of one who's been able to do something unique with it. Yeah. And James Gunn did a really great job with guardians, but that was subject matter was already kind of weird and yeah. funky. Um, and so I think that we're hurting our cause here by just putting out blockbuster, blockbuster, blockbuster. I went to Thor to the premiere yeah. and I thinking I'd already seen Thor. Oh, you hadn't seen Thor. Turned out. No, I was like, I this doesn't seem familiar. I don't remember this. Oh, wait, did I see <laughs> Captain America? What was the one that I went? Was it, you know, it's just like all these big bulky dudes in suits. And I like, I get it. Like comics. I understand that they're very important to people. And it's also <laughs> like, we are so lucky that we get to have this stuff now. Right. Yeah. Um, for me, it's video games. That was my thing. Like I, but at the same time, it's just, ah, uh, it's hard to watch people take something that's so special and just kind of go like, how can I get all the money out of it? You know, well, I, I definitely do think that the MCU has done a pretty, pretty damn good job with their structure. I think that they, I mean, I think they've obviously kind of led the way. It's funny. You mentioned Thor and Thor too. I think those are the two worst MCU movies in my personal opinion. <laughs> yeah. I, I, those, are, those are the ones I like the least, but definitely there have been some misses from the other studios. Cause uh, you know, I mean, it, their investments, they're trying to make a lot of money back and, and they do, they pull out all the stops trying to do it. Doesn't always yeah. Work. Um, what kind of movies do you love though? What, like, where's, where does your, what's your preference? I, yeah, this is my movie wall. It's going to be a weird, I have a weird taste in film. So let me see if I can aim it. I don't know if this is going to even do anything. So, uh, this is the holiday. It's Cary Grant, yep. Catherine Hepburn. Okay. I have the shining Dr. Strange love. Actually, that's a still from Bo Burnham. Um, M Princess Mononoke, uh, Beetlejuice over there. And then. An Affair to Remember, which is another Cary Grant film. And then that's the Edward Moybridge, but that's not a real, that's not a film. That's just the first piece of film that was ever made. But yes, so I, I love classics and weird 90s films and 80s films. And um, I love The Mummy and Moulin Rouge. I have like a very strange sort of all over okay. taste in film, but Kubrick's my number one. He's your guy. Yeah, he's I, my uh... guy. I've gone back and re I recently, like maybe two months ago, rewatched The Shining probably, I don't know, for like the fifth or sixth time. Probably it was not a movie that I grew up watching. Um, mm -hmm. And I I still think that the opening shots in The Shining, those helicopter shots, I think that's like one of the most incredible things ever put on film. I, I agree. Kind of right. Blows your mind. when you And also the aerial shots over the maze. Both of those two things in that movie are like kind of it's unbelievable that that's 1980. I, oh, it's so years. special. He's yeah. so special. Um, did you see uh, Dr. Sleep? Uh, I did. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> I can see it in your face there. Yeah, you're okay. Uh, it's not, it's not, that's not the worst, but it's just like. It was, uh, it, yeah, it was like, it, it like did enough. Like I, it was very polarizing. I didn't see it when it was first out, but I, I, after the fact saw it, I love Rebecca Ferguson so much. And I think she's so great in that movie. I mean, she really crushes it. And I like you in a lot. It's just, the movie just didn't. Didn't knock it out of the park for me. She wasn't scary to me at all. It's not her fault. It's not her fault at all. It's just that I think the subject, I think that that was Stephen King's story. And I just went, oh, did we have to do this one? Yeah. <laughs> like, I would have loved to see a continuation of The Shining. And I know that that was the original film. It was just like, they don't scare me. They're, they don't scare me. There's nothing scary about this, except for maybe the ghosts, kind of. But even then, it's not, it wasn't. The Shining had this really beautiful, unsettling quality that just yeah. alienated you. And I think that's what made The Shining The Shining, other than the beautiful shots and amazing acting, you know, iconic characters and performances. Anyway, um, but like that was the uns the thing that grabs you with The Shining is you're like, holy hell, I feel like I'm stuck in this hotel and I want to leave. But if I leave, I don't get to see the rest of this film. And that's not what Dr. Sleep is. Dr. Sleep's just like, it felt very kind of like Twilight. Totally. I feel it, I feel like the, the biggest miss on Dr. Sleep's part was, I actually think from a marketing perspective, it should have been called something that had The Shining in the title. Because I, I really do think a lot of people watch that trailer and were like, I don't really know what this is. You know, you know what? Who's who? Yeah, I know. I absolutely agree with you. I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't know until I was like, oh, wait, that's the Shining sequel, which yeah. I don't think that's the right word for it. Um, you know, wait, who was the, what was the name of the director who did it? The guy who did um, Haunting of Hill House. What's his name? I can't remember. Mike Flanagan. Thank you. It felt like an episode of Haunting of Hill House. I felt like yeah. I was watching that show, but with the Shining carpet. 
kind of. Anytime you throw that kind of iconic subject matter, though, and expect a sequel or, or something related, I think it's going to be really, really hard to deliver. I just Absolutely. That, you know, they were working. They were completely fighting an uphill battle. I, I agree. Yeah. And I think they did OK. But yeah. I just was. <sighs> yeah, bummed. I, feel like that one. <laughs> I really miss going to the movies. That's probably that's probably the thing close to the top of the list. I miss the most. What are you finding you miss the most uh, in quarantine? In quarantine. Well, to be honest, I have been sort of an agoraphobe for the past, not a sort of, I have been an agoraphobe for the past year. Um, if you're not familiar, it means I have a fear of actually leaving outside, the house yeah, and going yeah. places. Yeah. Um, so movie theaters were already difficult for me this year because I would, I'd feel very trapped. I wouldn't mm. be able to feel like I could leave. And um, I, I do think though, this is going to, Sorry, I'm going completely off topic from the question. Go for it. Go but for I, it. but you did say about movie theaters. I think we're going to have a whole hell of a lot of drive-ins, pop-up drive-ins in Los Angeles, is what I expect to see, uh, which is actually perfect for me because I can just turn on the car and go. If I if I start feeling anxious, I could leave. But you can also just sit there and enjoy some snacks. You know, hang out with your friends, and you know, you may not be able to sit right next to each other. But that's that's what I hope. I think that we should. I think we should be seeing a lot of those, which um, I look forward to. Um, things that I really miss in quarantine. I I mean, I really do miss traveling. I do like traveling. I miss being able to go to Palm Springs or just like hop in the car and go up north or something. Um, and I sort of miss, it feels like there's a an inability to experience time. It's just kind of yeah, that's there. Cool. It's crazy to think that we've been in shutdown here for two months about now wait yeah. no yeah yeah it's it started like the, the yeah first week of march two months we've been in and and that's just that's just nuts to me to think about because it feels like a year but also a week it does right i mean because we, because we've never experienced anything like this so it just feels like it's a little pocket of time that's never ending i mean i mm -hmm. i think there's a bunch of stuff I miss, right? I, I definitely miss restaurants. I miss being able to work in coffee yeah. shops. I, mean, I, I miss yeah. gym. I mean, there's oh, you're making work. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really bizarre to me. I do everything from this corner of my apartment. Yeah. I take every meeting. I do every interview, every stream, every movie review. Like all of it is right here. And it's really, really strange um, to just have to be so like tied to this one little space. Like this is my lifeboat. Yeah. Um, and that's yeah, that's that's definitely pretty strange. I'm very fortunate. Pardon my dog. Um, I'm very fortunate to be to have a home, like to have a proper house where I can walk around. I do have a partner here, so it's like if it was just the two of us in a in a flat alone. Yeah, I I don't know how we would handle handle it, but we have you know three dogs and we have a backyard, so life still sort of progresses. I do have the space and stuff. And I, I feel like that's a whole aspect of quarantine that you experienced that I'm actually uh, sort of missing out on. Like I don't have that sort of I'm here and this is where I am, you know, yeah, and that's, yep. that's gotta be really tough. Like it is, I, I, I experienced that on a, on a sort of less intense level, I think just sort of yeah. like the waves of, I guess it's morning. I guess it's night. I guess it's morning. I don't know. <laughs> Well, that's definitely true. I've seen you've been doing some streams uh, from from home during this time. Have you? Do you and your partner do any content together? Do you guys make anything together or no? He hangs out on streams, but he's he's an actor boy, and you know, actor boys they're not supposed to, you know. But I think that that's also loosening up a bit now too, especially with quarantine. Um, there's for people who aren't aware, if you're like an actor or something, they kind yeah. of you're not advised to make yourself available, you know, a whole lot right. on streams and stuff like that. And, you know, he wants to like, he, I know, and he's been sitting with me on streams and stuff too. But um, I mean, if we do make content together, we have been sort of working on short films and stuff oh, cool. as well. So we'll see. We're doing a lot. We're doing a lot of writing as well. That's good. Yeah. The time using this time to be creative is great. Um, so, so you mentioned earlier that you've been doing a lot of, that writing is something that you like doing. What kind of stuff do you write? Are you writing TV stuff? Are you writing movies? Are you writing books? Um, I write, I primarily write screenplays, um, short films. Uh, let me see. Sometimes really bad poetry. Uh, we've got sort of like, I run the gamut. I haven't written a novel. I don't like huge blocks of text. They stress me out. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I really do. I love, I love writing screenplays and I'm just sort of, um, uh, I like to just lose myself in a story in a world that I've, I've created for myself. 
do you find uh because i know you love video games you've played a lot of them do you find the stories in video games to be as engaging as those in movies tv oh absolutely yeah of course like it's, it's it's also you get to drive the story or at least you have the illusion of driving the story depending on the game um i think it's so immersive Sometimes it's even hard for me to sit down and play a game because I'm kind of like, I'm not done here yet. Like, hold on, I, I'm yeah, not ready yeah. to just like, and also I, you know, when you're playing games, it's hard because you can't really play with your partner if you've got a partner there, um, depending again on the game. But if you want to get into the really immersive games that have really long storylines, you know, you do kind of weirdly have to sacrifice being with somebody else in order to really be sucked into that, which I do think is actually a little different than films. Because you could be sitting with your partner and watching the film together, but it's yeah. for whatever reason, it's just sort of harder to like think about Bioware games. Do you play? Do you play? Like, what's I'm not your? A big, I, I'm so I play Magic the Gathering. I have a big okay. podcast about it that I do, and I play Clash Royale. But I'm not like a console or like a the big games. Like I don't play a lot of that stuff. Right, right. Um, there's a developer named Bioware, and they make these video games that are RPGs, right? Yeah. And they're very heavy role playing. And you can actually sleep with you, one of your party or two of your how many of your party you want, um, but they can get mad at each other. So there's like this weird sort of masturbatory element where you're playing this game, and you know, boyfriend sitting next to me, I kind of go, I don't want, I don't want you to watch me do this. This is really <laughs> weird. I don't want you to watch me hit on this alien chick. Please don't. Um, and, and I think that's in a weird way that I think that's why video games in my mind are more immersive than movies because it's not as like, this is a video games can be so personal yeah. storylines, you know, that's so interesting. How many, how many years have you been doing the, the online streaming? Like that's been a big part of your life. So streaming's not been, um, I worked for Facebook for a year, okay. um, and then sort of dipped out of that. Cause I just didn't like being held to a, a two hour daily schedule because I felt like the stuff that I was making after, you know, every day just wasn't going to be the best because, you know, you've got people who are doing eight hour day streams. I just am not that guy. I grew up, I was a host, so I want to yeah. bring everything. So I just got very like, but I do. So I've been streaming and I streamed at Machinima, but weirdly, I wouldn't call myself a streamer. I just kind of like having, especially in quarantine, having sort of a group of people to chat with and, and play games with, you know, um, it's just a, it's just a kind of weird little hobby, like a side gig. Yeah. I don't make any money. I don't, I don't, you know, have any donations or anything. They're just, it's just play games. It's more to it for fun. Mm -hmm. oh, that's cool. But you like connecting to the audience. It's nice to engage with fans and things like that. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I've ever had quote unquote fans. Um, I, cause I, the, the reason I know that sounds really hold on, that's going to sound douchey too. But what I mean by this is like when I would go to conventions and I would walk by somebody, they would go, Hey, Chloe. And I would never know if I actually knew them or they just knew by stuff. They would just go, Oh, it's, it was just like, Hey, Chloe. It was never like, Oh my God, Chloe. It was just, you know, um, and I always wanted, endeavored that the stuff that I made would never make somebody feel like a fan, but rather like somebody just wants to hang out and, and and talk you know we that's, have i mean that's the most that's the best part of the current sort of like digital content what what have you is um people the wall's been broken down so as long as your supporters yeah. and the people who like your stuff are cool which like generally speaking if you do a lot of content you'll get people that are attracted to it that are pretty cool you get to sort of build that direct connection i mean i'm definitely that's that's been the, the lifeblood of kind of my wanting to do any of this stuff is i like meeting supporters you know fans i think it's a weird word like you when you say it, i hate it i hate the word <laughs> i hate the word i god i uh when you go to conventions and people are like my fans and i go no stop because yeah. fan is short for fanatic it's like yeah. the people who are obsessed with me it's just such a weird totally Ugh, sorry i just cracked my knuckle i maybe i'm being very <laughs> judgmental i don't know i just don't like it you i think that you definitely have fans i mean it's clear from your public profile that you do but I, I know what you mean i totally get what you're saying i would say i think supporters are probably the best because the fact is like we is you're not you don't have supporters unless there are people like literally supporting you you know yeah so i would say that's probably do you go to every comic con i mean have you i know i saw you at this last one we were at once one of the parties together, but have you missed one in a while? Oh yeah. Uh, I mean, this year has been very quiet. I I'm looking over at my badge box. Um, I've been through, I've been, Oh my God, hon, I'm not going to, let me just grab it. I just want you to, don't worry. It's right here. I'm not, it won't be long. 
You don't even have to vamp. It's fine. Okay. Oh, it's so hot. So <laughs> it's oh, cool. like my badge box. It's yeah. just never ending. Bad. Like it just yeah, never yeah, ends. Yeah. I love it. I love it. <laughs> so I have done, I just feel kind of like, I love conventions and I feel like they've kind of, um, some of them, like Comic-Con's a tough one because I feel like Comic-Con's changed a little bit. The Comic-Con is is a totally like insane, overwhelming animal. I think people call it Nerd Vegas sometimes, and it does. Yeah, like, Nerdy Gras. Wait, no, yeah. Nerdy Gras is Dragon Con. That's the one that I okay. hit for Dragon okay. Con. <laughs> um, I've done every convention I think, except for a few little ones here and there, or uh, you know, I've done almost. Let's just say almost every convention. Yeah. Um, and it's yeah, it's I. I, I have taken a bit of a break from it because I feel like there's, unless you're working there, there's only so much that can be accomplished. Sure. I right. think by going, uh, it's fun, but it's also, I don't want, I don't want to wait. I can just look at panels online. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's definitely an interesting point you make. I, I remember Comic-Con the first time I went versus when I've gone now, you know, I don't work pressed at Comic-Con anymore. I did that for a few years and I enjoyed it. I like doing interviews and, and talking to people. Um, Red carpets are cool. I think that's when I first met you. Actually, was on a red carpet in twenty one of the last couple of years. I don't remember when it was. Mm -hmm. um, but when you stop doing that, and then you're not—I don't want to wait in line to go to panels either. Then it starts to be: Am I just driving to San Diego to pay a lot of money for a hotel? Yeah. So I can try to get into these parties that after you do it for a couple of years, and they are fun. They're great. Don't get me wrong. I really enjoy them. Like they all start to feel like the exact same party. Everybody's just driving from LA to go hang out in San Diego. Oh, we're all old. Ben, how old are you? Oh, 31. You're in, oh, you're 30. Yeah, I'm 31 too. I'm just getting okay. to this point where I'm like, I, no, I'm, that's wrong. I still like going to parties sometimes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's I mean, the, the it's fun. I'm not going to pretend I'm above <laughs> them. They are fun. Um, but, but I think the nights that where you go out all night, you know, uh, cause I would, when I was doing conventions like several times a month, you know, when you're going out all night for three nights in the weekend, there's you're just going like, oh, I can't, I can't do this anymore. I'm just so tired. You know, you have to go Dude, work the next day with a hangover anymore. Are you kidding? No, like that's what I mean. Like, <laughs> it's just so it, you have to pay a price now. And we never like, I feel like I didn't have to pay a price. And now I'm just like, it's just, I'll just go home and I'm going to go to the hotel, have some, have some uh, room service, yeah. <laughs> you know, do nothing. Yeah, like I, I judge the hotel that I'm going to stay at now. Like, do they have a spa? Is it? Uh, yeah. Is the restaurant any good? Exactly. Um, it's, it's a completely different story now than it used to be. Yeah. And I was also some sort of weird bohemian aspect to it before. And I, it's just for some reason, maybe it's just me, but I feel like that sort of is gone in a weird way. Well, Comic-Con feels, I mean, Comic-Con, like in a way that they talk about Sundance and what it used to be versus what it is now. I think the com like the heavy commercialization of any of these things from advertisers. It's hard. And I still really like Comic-Con. Like, I'm really bummed it got canceled this year. It, yeah. it sucks. I was definitely looking forward to it. Um, but it definitely doesn't have the same, like, nerd paradise feel that people would no. talk about. Because I only went to my first Comic-Con in, like, 2015. And I, you know, I, from what I understand, it's it was uh, it was very different. Um, there's a there feels like there's a class system there too like i yeah, other conventions don't have that but i feel like at comic-con there is this weird sort of class system it's like are you do you work on a show like do you, yeah, you know right. a famous actor if not you're not going to this party with all the famous actors if not and you know i i kind of did that thing i did that and i'm like i just i i just don't feel the desire because i again this is not other conventions right other conventions are great like yeah. if you look at dragon con there is no class the whole point of dragon con is everybody just hangs out drinks with everybody it's just a party it's really fun there's yeah. no one who's like you know going to this vip party you know yeah. um which comic con that's the whole thing now it just feels like what does your badge say really yeah yeah, the, the 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 open bar aspect of these things is is I laugh about this sometimes because I, I've I've gone uh, in and out of phases of my life where I've decided to like take time off from drinking, drink less, and I always find that um, as soon as I take any time off drinking and I'm going to like premieres in L.A. or part, the open bar aspect as soon as it goes away changes my whole perception of the of the event, especially yeah. like if I'm trying to like get in shape or something where I can't eat any like the sliders or the good food they're bringing oh, around. I'm just sweating thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, oh absolutely. god a room full of people in some water okay here we go yeah 
Yeah. So I, that, that's definitely like, uh, it takes away some of the, some of the appeal. Now I, yeah. I, I know you, uh, you very publicly dated somebody who was sober for a long time. Have you ever gone in and out of that? Or have you always been somebody who's just kind of drank and had fun with it? No, I, I, when I dated him, I was sober as well. Um, sober is a weird word. I just didn't drink. I didn't, you know, I didn't have some journey. I drank, I grew up with parents that were like wine at 16. I think I'm English. My mom thinks she's English. She's not, but she thinks she is. It's very cute. Yeah. Um, so I have, you know, had a very healthy relationship with alcohol and I think weirdly it got worse because of the conventions. And I worked at a working, uh, I, I had a, a work atmosphere that was like, let's start drinking at noon. So I just kind of started, I'm like, wait, hold on. I got to slow down. So actually I'm weirdly in a process right now, especially in quarantine of trying to not drink as much. Yeah. Uh, oh, I, I mean, quit smoking stuff, two months ago. So I'm like, can I at least have. Let me have this, please. Uh, but I know that it's, I got I to gotta cut back on it too. It's very easy to just go, it's fine. It's a cool, cold drink. I mean, we're all just stuck at home wanting to, to drink. That's the, that's the truth yeah. of the matter, you know? It God. sucks. We're all going to come out and be like, oh, or is it, we got to talk to somebody about this. <laughs> Who do I, I talk to? <laughs> I know, it's funny. Well, I was thinking about that too. Like, so how, how are people in the program handling it right now? That's something I was wondering about. I oh, about yeah. The, that's got to be... In the first month, you can't go. I mean, you, you're not physically supposed to go to a meeting. I guess now you're going and you're staying six feet away the same way that like people taking press conferences with the president are doing. But like I know in the beginning that day to day stuff for, for, for addicts is important. Like you have to go oh, yeah. every day if you weren't. I going can't even day. imagine. I, I as somebody who has I smoked since I was 14 and this yeah. is sort of like I have to quit now. And it's as somebody I struggle with wanting to have a cigarette every like every hour on the hour I go, Oh, I just, cause you're just yeah. sitting at home. And you know, one of the things about smoking is you do it when you're bored or when you don't have something to do, or when you do have something to do, you want to push it off. So it's just a constant, I can't even imagine. I it's gotta be real rough for people in the program. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't even know what the answer is. Honestly, I, I, I was thinking about it the other day, but um, just a question I have for you. So having done comic con for such a long time and obviously hosting jobs dating back to the beginning of uh, the 2010s, what do you see as the biggest difference in sort of digital content creation, this this nerd media space now versus back then when you got started? Like, does it feel like a very different landscape? To oh, you? God. Yes. This so totally different. I it's it, it's it's good for everyone and then bad for some people. Um, I think that when it comes to digital media creation, uh, you know, for a long time, there were jobs for hosts, right? And that was something that I did. That was my job. I was a host. Yeah. Um, there were jobs for us. And, you know, it was valued to have skills in that arena, like interviewing people, uh, reading prompter, all of that stuff. And now there's the value is entirely in influence, right? Yeah. And it's a game that I don't like to play. I don't want to play it. And I know that you have to, and that's part of the game. But it is, uh, it's definitely a different story. I see a lot of my friends are struggling to find work because you have all of these influencers are coming and hosting and doing stuff like that. Um, but so that, so it's bad for, for that. But on the other side, it's also very good because so many people are getting opportunities to be creative and show their work around. It's not like you had to, before you had to sort of funnel into a thing, you have to funnel in here, you know, um, yeah. and, and find your way down to where you want to go. And now it's just like TikTok, put some shit on the internet, see if it, if it goes. And it's, I think it's great. I mean, it's also, we have the downsides, which is people get a voice that everyone should have a voice, but yeah. people get a voice and some people abuse that, I think, privilege. Um and I mean, but I don't know. I, I feel like what what what's your answer to that? I'm very curious to know what you, what you would say to that. I will answer your question if you answer me this. Are you on TikTok? I have a profile. <laughs> I don't post. It's okay. it's strange because I have. So I go on TikTok cringe on Reddit, which filters out all the best TikToks. Yeah. So you just read all. But if I go to the app and I pull up TikTok, I go. There's I this is wrong. I'm not supposed to be here. I feel like I'm walking through a high school <laughs> campus and I'm just like I you know, I where's the adult area? Can I just go there and you just can't it's 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 weird. Do you know what I mean? Oh, it makes It's yeah, all it these like me. 17-year-old girls like throwing it back. I'm like there no, I don't I don't want this. 
it makes me, yeah, TikTok has made me feel older than anything uh, recently has. I, I've like tried to be understanding of how to get into it. So I like just started posting clips basically, but not of actual TikToks. Like I have the series I'm doing on this channel called Song from the Scene where basically uh, talk about great songs and great movies. I, I talk about the scene, why it's so great. And then I cover the song on a guitar and I'm just That's taking great. Act- Yeah, I love it. And so I'm taking little clips of the actual performances and just putting those on TikTok. But that's not like how you're supposed to do it because there's no like. I thought about it like down the road. I'm like, if I want to invest some time and make some cool TikToks, the way that you are successful on TikTok is you have to collaborate with other people on TikTok. Yeah, TikTokers. TikTokers. I don't want to like be collaborating with like five 22 year old dudes. It just feels like this is your guys's, you know what I mean? It's, I don't know. It, like thinking down in the investment line is that is that weird that i just i don't know no i think i you're look at tiktok right now it, by the way i don't know if tiktoker is a term people were using because we just use i it think it and, is yeah tiktoker is i think what you call it but i didn't no. want to assume for sure that's definitely funny um but i definitely think that it's a big platform with a lot of new users and like the cell that my buddy pitched me on the other day was like look dude you're doing this content on youtube and you want people to watch it right so put it on TikTok and maybe people yeah. will find it and then they might find your YouTube channel because of it. That's but you're great. Not putting it on TikTok, then they'll never find it. I think that's the way to do it. I think you take pre made content and put it on there. But if you're like making content that's specific to TikTok, you're like, I'm making TikTok content. Yeah. Like, <sighs> I know that there people, we're all going to filter in. Millennials are going to take over. Like, they're going to have to just deal with it. But up until that point, I'm just going to wait until everybody else shows up and they'll be like, all right, I'm here. I'm here now, guys. <laughs> I, yeah, I feel like it's like any social media app too. Like if it if, if you start to do well on it, then it's fun. But um, to answer your question from a second ago, how how do I think it's changed? I got into digital media like 2014 was the year I started hosting. Uh, it was like towards the end of the year and I was getting into it kind of uh, doing after shows and stuff like that, starting a podcast about movies. And mm. it, I know like the nerd space was already rolling at that point. Um, but the big change that I've seen is that those major companies that used to provide jobs all kind of realized within this course of about 24 months that there's no sustainability to yep. the audience because the audience isn't directly funding their company. Absolutely. Right? That's absolutely true. And I think so a lot of people lost their jobs and a lot of companies folded. But what's really interesting, what you're seeing is you know, if you look at creators that go out on their own and start to really, really work and hustle and try to directly connect to their audience, people can make a living doing that. Um, Mm -hmm. And a pretty good living if you're good at it and you work hard at it. You look at a lot of people out there and that's, I don't know how a major company will ever be able to harness that and make it work for the company because they have to bring an asset. Like they really have to bring value is the interesting thing. If you look back- Yeah, they have to work really hard to bring value, yeah. If you think about like the studio system, you know, those, those, po- those pictures you have on your wall from those days, like they owned the only game in town. Like, yeah, they exactly. Had the cameras, they had the deal to distribute the movies. So they could just say like, we're going to make you a star, go shoot this movie. We'll put it out. No one else can put it out. Go sign. You know, if, if you don't yeah. sign with one of these studios, your movie's not going to ever get seen. And like, that's not really the case anymore. You can just, you build up a big enough audience on YouTube. You control it on, on Vimeo, on TikTok, on any of these apps. That's all just a different form of content. And at a certain point, if people like you enough and they connect to you enough and they feel like they can relate to you enough, they'll want to see you succeed. They'll support you. And I think that feels like a difference. We don't have celebrities really a whole lot anymore. We do, but they're not, you know, we have, you know, Zendaya and Timothy Chalamet and stuff like that, but we don't have, you know, Jennifer Aniston and, and Brad Pitt and Matt Damon and Ben Affleck and all of these like, yeah, yeah. Movie stars. Um, movie stars. We don't have A-listers anymore. And I don't know if we ever really, maybe in certain, in a certain way we kind of will, but I don't know if they're ever going to be like the household, the household names are, it, it just, all of it is so confusing to me. Like I'll find out about somebody. There's this woman, Sabrina Carpenter. And if she was trending, I'm like, who is this? She's got like millions of followers. She's like a hugely popular singer. It's, yeah. And I don't, I don't know. Like these are things that I just. Yeah. It, it the the zeitgeist is not 
accessible the way that it used to be where everybody can see it. It's all just like weird little pockets. All I know over. that is, that is very, very true. Um, the, the weird pocket thing. I mean, people, people can, can gain notoriety in this small way, but all you need is that small amount of it to, to sustain a personality. And, um, I guess, so my question for you is back, back in 2018, you wrote an essay on medium that got like a lot of press. A lot of people read it. Your name was in the news. I remember. Mm. And, as a kind of public personality content creator, do you do you notice distinctly a difference in your life from before you wrote that to now? I mean, is it like a clear difference? Oh, yeah. No, I mean, I would say, you know, my name is absolutely associated with that for as long as it, it will be until I can somehow sort of come out and do something where it's not... It, it, Luckily, I'll say this, nobody knows who the fuck I am, right? I, no, no one knows who I am. So I have that going for me. But um, it's also very difficult because if you do search my name, uh, that's what comes up now. Um, I had, I've worked for a decade. Like I've worked so many places. I've done so many things. I've done films. I've done, I've produced shows. I've, you know, I've done so many things. And if you search it, you know, that's what comes up. And so that's, uh, I think that there was a small possibility. I think I knew that when I posted it, that there was a small possibility that was, this was going to fuck my career forever. I, I, sure. I knew that, but I also thought at the time I was like, no, one's going to read this. No, one's going to know what's going on. This is just a, uh, an essay for the people on medium. You know, uh, there was no one's, it's not going to go anywhere. I also underestimated, I guess myself at that point thinking like, nobody's going to read it. Right. Yeah. Um, I even took it to my community manager friend and he was like, no one's going to read this. It's fine. And I went, okay. Okay, good. And then when I woke up the next morning, I almost, ha I almost just fainted. I opened my Twitter and I, I it was a picture of me and, uh, I just, oh God, it's, I wish I could, I hope no one has to feel what I felt that morning. Um, so yeah, I think there, I, I, I don't think, I know that there's a distinct, um, change and I'm, I know that I'm fighting an uphill battle here, trying to, um, sort of make it a new place for myself as something. Uh, but you know, you just got to keep trying. I've, I had, I got blacklisted then and I, I didn't get a real job and I was making, I was making content for free for like a year or two before I could get another proper job after we broke up um, through friends. And then I've, I mean, I've had to reinvent myself several times, you know, and there are definitely, um, it, it's stacked against me. I'm not gonna lie, but I'm, I'm gonna just keep, I'm gonna keep trying, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's, that was one thing that I noticed, uh, when I read it. Cause I mean, I, like I said, I, I met you, I think formally on a red carpet, I think for like, I wish I can remember what the event was. It was, a yeah, green, I know. I can't remember green carpet. It was a JJ Abrams thing. Uh, oh. beginning of 2019 maybe we Seven. talked about clash royale the whole time was this, i know but it, it wasn't <laughs> oh god i know i can't remember what it was yeah but I, I remember at that point um you know it had come out i had i had read it when you wrote it because like you said it was kind of front page and um obviously this space is very much i'm in the same space as you so there was a story that people were talking about but i remember when i read it you mentioned in there that you had gotten blacklisted and now it sounds like you've gone through a similar period again um is it the same, same experience or kind of a different type of blacklisting, uh, whatever. No, it's a very different thing. Uh, like before I would have, I had some people, I had the place call my agent saying, you know, your boy, ex-boyfriend called and said he wouldn't work with us if straight up okay. they continued to employ you. And, um, they called my agents and they said, we're so sorry. It's super unprofessional, but this is just how things are. Okay. Cool. And so that was not just even that, like guests were refused to come on the shows that I would have. Sure. Um, you know, I would get emails and I would, I, I had a show where I would be like, that. you know, it was an after show and uh, somebody was meant to be on it. And I knew that he had a connection with Chris. And so I reached out to him and I said, just so you know, I'm hosting the show. I don't know if you know this because the booker probably didn't tell you, but I'm sure everything's okay. I don't want to assume and probably it's not a big deal, but and he wrote back and he said, no, I'm going to not do the show. So, and you know, I, I noticed this so often, like, and it was over years, it just didn't stop. Um, and so I think it was, it was very difficult 
uh, uh, to be have lost my career over um, somebody who was so not nice to me during it um, and uh, during the relationship. And I just, I, I felt like the, there was a lot of just wrong information. Uh, and now I have said what happened on my side, right? Yeah, I've right. said what I experienced. And now you have all of the parts and you can choose to either listen to what he says and believe that, or you can choose to listen to what I say and believe that, make your own decision. But before my part wasn't even out there, right? So the fact is I don't, it's it's tough. Uh, but I also know that when people are part of a scandal, right? If you're a part of like some sort of hot topic or whatever, and yeah. I know that it, mine was particularly con controversial because AMC decided that, uh, right. not even necessarily that I wasn't telling the truth, but that they would just, it was not detrimental enough to them to stop, you know, to terminate that contract. Yep. Uh, so, you know, it, it is what it is. And I understand if people don't want to believe they don't want to believe there's no, there's no, I had, I didn't release any actual evidence to show, right. I have it for, for potential other things. Um, but I didn't release it. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I just were, wanted it to go away <laughs> to be were, honest. In the, yeah. I mean, you were clear in the article and you wrote it in the first place that that point of it was to not put that stuff out there. You were writing it for, to move on with your life. I think something you said a second ago that really particularly sticks with me is you mentioned ruined your career. When I announced to my audience that I was doing an interview with you, they were overjoyed with excitement. You should have seen the really? Yeah, and which is really interesting because I've never worked with you before. And a lot of the stuff that I'm really tied into, uh, you know, you're not in the schmo down. You don't do Magic the Gathering stuff with me or anything like that. But I mean, you're a very, very well-liked personality in this space. And I think that the idea maybe you mentioned you're agoraphobe that, you know, you that that, that that's the perception I think is incorrect. And, I, and uh, at least personally from one that I, as somebody who's been a fan of you, that I think is untrue. And I think that, you know, I wouldn't hold on to that because it's. Oh, thanks, Ben. I, I look. I just did it. The thing is, I also just did a podcast with a girlfriend of mine. And she's amazing. Um, and the problem is, there's a lot of the gamer audience. There's a lot of a lot of dudes yeah, yep. in the gamer audience. <laughs> um, yeah. And it was hard because it, it was hard to look at. It's not even hard. I, I've been called all sorts of things, and I'm used yeah. to it. You know, even before this, the essay came out. I mean. Oh, the things I was called. Um, so I do have a pretty thick skin, but it was just, you know, there were a lot of people in there going, how dare you talk to this woman? Um, you know, she's, I don't talk to, I don't watch things with false accusers and stuff like that. And you have to go right. there and go, is this like going back to the pockets, right? There's certain pockets where people were like, she's cool. She's great or whatever. I like, I liked this thing she did. And then their pockets are like, she lied. She, she was, uh, you know, she, she's a false accuser or, you know, a scorned woman or whatever. So it's, it's tough to know where you stand when you look at these different pockets. Cause when you're in one pocket, you go, this is the world, you know, yeah, that's yeah. maybe not true. I don't know. That is very nice to know. And that makes me feel very happy, Ben. Yeah. Well, you should know it. I, I think internet, internet, um, I, I, when people say a culture of outrage, I, I always like to sort of counter back. I don't think that that's really true because people like to use that word as though, it suggests that a culture of outrage is that people are outraged for no reason, which I think is wrong. That yeah. Shitty things happen in the world. People deserve to be angry about them. If they want to voice it on the internet. They can. Um, but that culture, has that been a major, uh, has it influenced any of your ambition to start new things? Like, have oh, you found yeah. It's terrifying. <laughs> I, I used to be a really happy go lucky girl. I was very optimistic, very like trusting of people. I loved conventions and I go in with open arms and stuff. And I was just, so I, I was very just like, I saw rainbows. I was like, this is a beautiful world full of beautiful opportunities. Um, despite like, I, I didn't have uh, very privileged. I was very privileged growing up, but I also had a lot of depression, really bad anxiety growing up, you know? And I just thought, you know, I'm going to get through it. I got through this. I got through that. This is, this is good. And I had a, a, a series of very not great things happen to me. Um, including, you know, I, I did, I wrote the essay, so that's on me, but you know, there's definitely other things that happened. And I, you know, there's a, a very close friend of mine, I found out was a horrible, horrible person. Um, and you know, it just sort of, there's still so much more shit that I can't even talk about. And I, 
It's something yeah. that I, I have to deal with. It's scary. Like, I feel like I just have limited my ability. I felt like I could have superpowers before. And now I feel like I just can't. I, I don't even want to try. And I do because I love making things. But it's definitely that sort of struggle of there's just a lot of a lot of bad things and a lot of not great people, you know. I totally get it. I think um, one of the one of the things when you say that that I can totally relate to is like, I mean, we're the same age, and like the the way I felt about, and I didn't write a I didn't write a, a, an essay and have the experience you had, so it certainly is not the same thing. But we have I we all have about, our own experiences. It's yeah, the way I felt about being creative and ambitious when I was like 21, 18, even like 24 is so different than I feel now. I'm still excited about stuff. I'm still like mm -hmm. so excited to do new things. And when, when I come up with a cool idea or or the audience responds well, it's such so gratifying. But like the the you when you fail, when you have when you go through things that don't work, you try things that don't work out, you do it enough times, the the gut check reality that starts to set in. Like that's, it's that's just a real a thing. So You're I, like it's Sisyphean in a way. Yeah, it's a lot. You have to just keep pushing and keep pushing. You know, as as a freelancer creator, you know, um, you just have to keep throwing stuff at the wall and see what sticks. I you've heard that phrase, but you have to see because it will fall off the wall eventually, and then you're gonna have to make another thing that sticks on the wall. You know, and yeah. Yeah. and it is it's it's really tough to have that bright eyed, bushy tailed feeling, you know, that you might have had when you're young, because it's just this whole landscape is so evolving. And and you don't know, there's a lot of negativity, and you don't know what's going to be what's going to work. There's no telling, you know? Yes. Do you, it, you mentioned that 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 bright eyed positivity that when you're really young, do you have a memory like one from from the early days in this in the space where you were like, it is all possible that you always remember feeling so happy? I'm, I believe I, I probably have a few of those. I, I think happiness is something that's very hard to come by because especially when you have ambition, I don't think they are very, um, they don't work very well together. Uh, but yeah, I think finding my place in conventions, I think were, were in gaming. I love gaming. I love the gaming industry. There's so many good people. When I go to gaming conventions and I'm surrounded by people that I love, I just feel good, you know? And I think that there is, I think my first one of my first hosting gigs when I was like 20 years old, I think. I'm sorry, I keep rambling. I, I there's just so much to talk about here. No, and go, go we're it. also going into the dangerous waters where I go, I have to be careful what I say. Uh pre recorded members. Pre recorded. <laughs> yeah. Uh no, I the thing is I don't like to ever sort of censor myself. I I'm I, I like yeah. to think that I'm an open book. Um to 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 an extent, I guess, unfortunately. But yeah, yeah so when I was at this, I remember I was interviewing booth babes and this is super not cool what we did uh but we were interviewing booth babes and my job was to sort of like give them very simple gaming questions and go haha they don't know Let's talk yeah. about gatekeeping for the record wasn't my idea but i yeah. i did i did engage in it and i did think it was kind of funny she and also i didn't for the record think they were going to get all of the any of the questions yeah um but i just remember having so much fun and i wasn't a great host but I loved it. And I thought, I'm going to get really good at this. And this is what I want to do. Uh, after modeling and acting and just feeling so out of place. And, you know, I, there, there was so much pressure to be pretty and good and funny and prepared and be this other character. And I just felt like I like kind of being myself now. I want to kind of just be myself. And yeah. that was the happy was when I kind of realized hosting was what I wanted to do. That was exactly, I, I mean, I wasn't interviewing booth babes, but I had the same experience as far mm -hmm. as, you know, when I transitioned away from acting, the big thing for me was like, I don't like having to make decisions with this so much. I have such a hard time getting high energy and being authentic when it's just my heart. It's so much easier to use my brain, to connect my head, to think things through, to talk things through, mm -hmm. which is why in the end hosting was the, was the thing for me. Like, especially stuff like this, where it's real, it's a real conversation. It's not like just a prompter because, you know, that can be very disingenuous if you're working on the travel channel. And you're oh, God. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 I know. never loved doing, I, I, I'm fine with prompter. I just don't, I prefer to have a more real conversation. That's always been my thing too. Yeah. Yeah. Cause those things, I mean, no, no, like knock on any of those networks and those jobs are great. Like I'd kill to have. Oh yeah, jobs. absolutely. Yeah. They're just, it's just a different sort of skill set. Um, 
And it's, I guess it's closer to acting at that point than it is hosting. I have I'm a, really I have a fun story, really short story about how yeah, I met yeah. my partner. Do you, I, how much time we're, are we okay for a, we're good. Two minutes. We, got like, we got like 15 more minutes. Okay, good. Okay. So, uh, my boyfriend, Cameron, I met him at a party. Uh, I saw him across the room. I had a, I had a boyfriend at the time. I was not interested in, in dating, but I saw him and I'm like, oh, that's a very good looking gentleman. And I walked by him and he, he said to, he turned to his brother and he said, oh, this is nothing like Comic-Con. And I went, for the record, we're at Chateau Marmont, which is like this really. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like super high <laughs> fancy like for rich people place so, hey, God. I, I don't like it but i was there with my girlfriend who invited me to a premiere of a, of yeah. a tv show and i went what did you just say and he was like oh yeah i was just saying it's nothing like comic-con and i was i was like i was just there that's so crazy what are you yeah. like and he well, I was like what were you there for and he goes oh i'm on this new show it's called krypton and i went Krypton, that's cool. Tell me, tell me about it. He goes, well, I play Superman's grandpa. And I go, <laughs> you look really young to be a grandpa. And he goes, I moisturize every day. And I go, you have been asked that 50 damn times. <laughs> I am sorry. And he's like, oh, thank God. Like there's all, you know, we just, there's that, he had that set up and I had the question, you know what I mean? It's just like when you do those interviews over and over, it's just soul sucking. You just go, <sighs> I moisturize, I moisturize, I moisturize. <laughs> and so we just, it was, it was cute. We became friends. And then later on, we're like, all right, I guess maybe we can give this a shot. So we'll give it a shot. There was a, the, the one, you had one boyfriend publicly that as somebody that I worked with a little bit in the Shmoda and I was Sam Whitworth. He was like a champion of the movie trivia Shmoda and Star Wars league at one point. He doesn't play anymore in the league. Um, but, uh, but that, that's, that's funny that, that like, I, I barely even know you, but I'm like aware at least of a couple of your boyfriends. <laughs> My partners. I just... famously date. <laughs> I think I was, a lot of it was known for who I was dating. It was, it, it was uh, I always, I found uh, a lot of boys in the nerd world that I was like, you're handsome. I want to date you now. That's so, so, okay. And, and moving away from any of the really controversial stuff, um, cause you know, you were great thing. I appreciate you answering any questions and talking about I'm, it. Now. I'm open. I, I, there will probably be things if you ask, I'd be like, Oh, I don't know if I should talk about that, yeah. but. <laughs> well, so just the actual aspect of being known ha as having dated someone like that was the big, that seems to be like one of the big breaks in your career was having dated Chris. Was that a, like a sort of a head fuck after the fact, realizing that like in terms of reinventing yourself as a performer? Cause that seems like that would be a challenge that to me. Oh, it had. sucked. I don't, I don't, I never wanted to be, I mean, one of the other, I mean, I left him for a lot of reasons, but one of them was like, I literally can never not be this guy's girlfriend. I don't want, and now, unfortunately with this essay, I've now cemented myself as that guy's ex-girlfriend. Uh, but you know, I, I always liked people who were ambitious and who inspired me. And Chris at the time when we first started dating, wasn't like what he what he became. became he had a small podcast and he played video games i met him at a doctor who convention i'm like you're a cool hot nerd boy right like let's let's date um and i definitely felt more comfortable to go into that career which i was already sort of on that career path and yeah. then um actually remember he did i th i even talked about it he sort of encouraged me to do a job that I didn't want to do. I never really wanted to work for him or at his company yeah. and stuff. Um, I kind of just liked the idea of us sort of working and then coming together and collaborating and then blah, blah. Uh, but yeah, it did, it did influence, I think, cause I, I did feel like I can take this leap and do this instead of modeling or whatever the hell I was doing at that time. Yeah, it, I, it would strike me as uh, as definitely one of the one of the greater challenges coming out of it. Have you you mentioned that there's stuff you you held on to that you didn't publish in the article, and that that looking back at writing it was so such a difficult day. Have you ever thought about writing sort of a follow up? I mean, no. I mean, uh, of course, you you know, you feel like you want to. There's like there are things. I'm like, there's so many things I wish <laughs> yeah, I could right. say. I I wish you guys could know what that experience was like when this investigation was happening. There's so much stuff that didn't. Yeah. That I, but it's not, no one cares. Like it's not, I said what I needed, which was um, don't, like this is what an emotionally abusive relationship looks like and what it can look like in the industry. And there are other ways to, uh, to uh, abuse your power over 
your partner that maybe people don't realize or they'll be in a relationship. Then. And that was ultimately what the goal was. And at the same time, it was also people who were, if they knew me, if they read it, they go, oh, this is what happened with Chloe, right? Yeah, right. Um, there, was, there, was, there were other reasons. It was also to just sort of like get this off of my chest. Um, and, but I don't have any, I don't want to like drive the stake in. I don't even know if I could drive the stake in. And I, I don't want that. That's not what the, the goal was. I just, uh, I'm, I'm open to talking about it, you know, on a podcast, but there's, there's no need to, to keep yeah. talking about it. It's in the past. I'm, I've moved on with my boyfriend and, and my life and he's, I assume moved on as well. Yeah, you. I mean, that's one of the things you mentioned is that the purpose of writing it was to move on. So I assume that was probably the answer, but I thought I'd ask um, just in case. So I have one one last question that I want to ask, and this is when I, I I've thought about. I got this inspiration from a friend of mine um, to ask this question, and this will be the first time I ask it. What is the most important thing you own? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, <laughs> that's the hardest question in the world. Well, I got asked the question and I was like, I have no idea how to answer that. And she was like, that's probably a pretty good red carpet question. I was like, that sounds like a pretty sweet question. I think I'll try that out. There's so many, like I, I have dogs, but I don't own them. Yeah. I mean, they're not free to leave, but I don't, you know, I don't own them. Um, I have, oh God, the most important thing, maybe my house, I guess. Like I would not have, if I didn't have a house, that'd be pretty, but that's a boring answer too. <laughs> oh God. It's tough. I have I have like a whole thing in the back here. See that closet right there? That's just yeah. full of like things that are special to me that I love. You know, I'll say here's a one. I'll just I have a lot of things that are like very special, but I think one of the most important things that I have is a shirt that my mom, my mom used to be a tour manager and I'd call her a groupie. She wouldn't, but uh, she worked, she worked with super tramp. She was their tour manager and Ooh. Bob Marley and all of these different. And she dated this guy, Johnny Nash, who's saying, I can see clearly now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, and he gave her this jacket, this shirt that he wore on tour and it fits me. He, this guy's like, tiny and it fits me and barely and he's got all of these handmade patches that he did all over it it's one of the cool i i would bring it up but it's a whole pain in the butt to go get <laughs> yeah, it but yeah, it's yeah, really yeah. cool i would say i i think that i use i would have maybe said something very like in the gaming world before i probably yeah. would have been like this thing that's signed by this guy the stardew valley guidebook uh but i think now as i've gotten older i've stopped sort of identifying as a gamer and just sort of gone it's all part of one thing. I think that shirt is one of the most special things I own. Probably. That's awesome. I, What's I, your, what was yours? What was your answer? I don't, I don't have the clear answer. I mean, I have, that's like, not fair. You can't ask me that and not even have an answer yourself. That's well, not no, fair, Ben. I can like, I can. Okay. So I can like suggest a few things that are cool that I own, like things that are special to me. I just, I guess I just don't know if there's one single one, which is why I was struggling. And why I thought I would ask you to put you on the spot. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, no. I think I like, uh, so I have a few guitars, one of which was given to me by my grandfather when I was graduating high school and I still have it. Um, and I wrote all of like the early music of my life on that guitar and, um, but I never play it. I bought, I bought one later that I play always and I don't ever play that guitar anymore. So there's like that special. Um, I, when you mentioned the, the tour jacket, so I love Tom Petty. He's my favorite artist of all time. And, um, there was this one stream I was doing like a year ago where I was talking about how I'd always really wanted a Tom Petty tour shirt, but I don't know how familiar with Tom Petty's catalog, but basically he American girl, all that stuff in the mid seventies, he got really big for a few years. And then most of the eighties is garbage. Like he, he doesn't really. And then in the late eighties, he gets really famous again with like free fallen and running down a dream and Mary Jane's last dance. But um, because he got really famous again in like 88, 89, 90, the shirts are all like real big and baggy and like tie dye <laughs> and, they're like just kind of like nineties looking. They're not great. Yeah. And so I always would say like, I would only want a petty shirt from like 81 or earlier. Cause those are like the best tours. And so I was talking to my fans about it and I'm the fans was that were. And, <laughs> How dare you get yeah. out of your own podcast. <laughs> and they were like, they were like, we, and so when I went to do a Schmodown show in New York last, uh, I guess it was probably in August that I went, um, they had rallied together and found this <gasps> shirt, this really, really expensive Tom Petty shirt. 
like oh my from- god that's so great what wonderful people yeah and they and they they have it on video they like pulled me backstage and, and surprised me with it and gave it to me and it's it's too small for me but uh i i have I'll it, borrow it. I'll yeah. take it. <laughs> and i've intended to frame it for a long time oh that's so sweet i love that that's such a great see that's oh, such a good story yeah it's a good one so the, i have a few things that i really love i don't have like that one thing you know what i mean uh there's so many things from like my past and I assume yours as well, where it's just like, this is just such a perfect yeah. memento of this thing in my life and it brings me so much joy. But yeah, you know, my grandfather uh, who gave me that guitar won the Nobel prize back in 1998. Shut up, really? Yeah. Yeah. He's just fun. He actually, uh, <laughs> he was on the cover of the New York times. It said a uh, love doctor wins Nobel prize because he uh, is credited as the inventor of Viagra. That's like, that is- <laughs> no, my God, that's the, Oh my God, that's the best claim to fame. Ah, man. That's Not because so good. he invented the product, but he, he has this medical discovery that he did for his his research facility. And then and then that patent was bought from that facility by this company. That company became Viagra. So how do you uh, not introduce yourself as that every time? In high school, I definitely did. Um, no, <laughs> that's so no, cool. I, <laughs> but uh, when he, and there was like a 10 year, 50, whatever it was, there was a, there was an anniversary. It was the 20 year anniversary in, in, uh, in 2018. And, uh, it's behind me over here on my bookshelf, but I have a giant, like a, like a chocolate coin, like gelt, like you would get for Hanukkah, like, but it's actually his Nobel prize and it's made of chocolate. Oh my uh, gosh. They made like, they made a certain number of these for my family members and I got one. And so I, I have it. That's, I, I, it's weird. Just to... that's such a great one. Yeah. That's so good. Yeah. I, I mean, when my dad stops caring, I'll have a couple Oscars in the house at some point. Oh, that's amazing. What, which Oscars does your dad win? That's so cool. Um, well, it's not, it's not a Nobel Peace Prize for Vi- Viagra. I'll say that much. <laughs> uh, my dad did visual effects, uh, for, he did the original Star Wars. So he got an, and he did Spider-Man too. So he has the, he's done a lot of movies, but those are the ones that he, he won for. Your dad won an Oscar for Star Wars, A New Hope? Yeah. Wow, that is so fucking cool. So you didn't know, <laughs> really, you didn't know about my dad being a visual effects guy? I totally knew he was a visual effects guy, and I and I had read about it. I guess I just didn't. I didn't. No, I love that. Yeah, I love that. I got to dive. surprise you with that. That makes me happy. Most people are like Chloe Dykstra. Oh, her dad does. She's she's just she's riding her dad's coattails. I'm like I'm not even in visual effects, you guys. <laughs> That's amazing. What a, what a cool thing. That's that. I mean. So you'll have a Star Wars Oscar. I mean, that's that'll be that's that's pretty cool. It's pretty neat. I would say it's yeah. pretty cool. I actually think I prefer the Spider Man two one because that was he thanked me for it, so that's more special. To that's me. also amazing. Yeah. Wow. Good stuff. <laughs> um, well, I think I think we can end on the uh, on the 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 Viagra and and Star Wars story. <laughs> um, but uh, that's how, that's what you should call this, by the way. Yeah, Viagra and Star Wars. That's that'll mm-hmm. be the title of the show. Um, but thank you so much for coming on doing this. I really appreciate you making the time. This was super fun. Yeah, um, thanks, Ben. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed myself. Yeah, yeah. And guys, if you want to follow along with what Chloe's doing, your your sky dart everywhere, is that true? The sky dart yeah. all across the board, yep. Yeah, cool. And if you guys, uh, we're, we're on the quest right now to hit 2,000 subs in our first month. So let's, uh, if you guys are watching this, hit that subscribe button, leave a comment below, um, hit, the, hit the thumbs up, and uh, come back every single Wednesday for Song from the Scene and every Friday for another episode of A Great Conversation. Chloe, I salute you. Thank you so much for doing the show. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.